Uh, I'm Alonzo, uh, one of the principal consultants here at Catapult, and uh, we're going to be taking you guys today through a look at some web application security fails because this will give some context and to uh, help you guys look at or determining whether or not your line of business applications are secure. Uh, and our co-presenter here is Jay. Jay, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Sawyer. I am also a principal consultant here at Catapult Systems, uh, based out of the Houston area. So I guess with that, uh, as we get started here, just if you guys have questions, feel free to chime in. We're watching chat and everything else, and we'll be happy to interact with you as you guys see fit. But you know, kick things off. Um, you know, one of the common things that we get asked or that we ask or we should look at is why should we care about application security? Um, and to, to be a little bit more concise on this, we're talking specifically about the application security aspect of things, not the entire network, the entire security strategy that a comp compensation or an organization might have. But the reality of why it's so important to look at the individual applications is we're seeing that just more and more of these uh, cyber attacks are happening. Uh, some of the research that we've done on this and, and that we've uh, uh, collected shows us that there's just a huge discrepancy in what experts say the probability of a cyber attack happening uh, are. Some of the conservative studies say, you know, one in 312 companies are going to get hacked per year. That's a successful breach uh, due to an application breach or some sort of other uh, security issue. Uh, some of the more extreme studies are basically saying one in two companies are getting hacked every year. They just may not know about it. The reality is that regardless of what statistic we look at, it's more likely for a data breach to occur to an organization than it is for an individual to catch the flu each, each year. And that's, you know, definitely a cause for concern. Um, again, given that all organizations are now virtually connected to the internet that connection to the internet makes every single application vulnerable and we continue to see study after study year after year that the number one avenue or vector of attack is a web application it's basically makes up 43 percent of all breaches and those things hurt um, they take a long time to identify and to contain um, Many of those involve just a huge amount of customer uh, personal identifiable information or PII that gets exposed. 20% uh, of those involve employee PII. And in each of those cases, you're talking about significant amounts of money in terms of what it's going to cost to remediate uh, and to deal with fines and damages that uh, result from those things. So bottom line is every single application developer should care about application security. So let's go ahead and get get started with our failure stories. And we're really using these as you know examples um, that have been out in the public, that have actually been out in, in, in the news of where web apps uh, specifically have failed. So our fail number one looks at a toll road authority website. And what happened here is once a user was authenticated, so, you know, if, if I went in and I logged into my account on the Toll Road Authority website, right, I could then use that authentication session and then access any other user's account information. And as a result, what you would be able to do is, is actually see the other user's credit card numbers. You could see their social security numbers, their driver's license numbers as well as their full name, their home address, their phone number, license plates, et cetera, right? So everything you needed to actually you know, become this person. So Alonzo was just talking about, you know, 80% uh, of these breaches involve customer PII. This is kind of the extreme of that. This is all of that PII, all in one shot, all in one exposure. So what happened here? How did this occur? Well, what the way they did it was the account number um, to, to bring up the account was actually provided in, in the query string that you used to access the account. And once you got authenticated, it would it would redirect you um, to a URL that had your account number in the query string, and they never validated it again. 
they assumed that once you were authenticated and you got the account number, that, you know, that wasn't going to change. Now, what they did is they used an iframe, which they called a security window. I use that term very loosely, but they used an iframe to hide it, right? So that the average user wouldn't see it. And then from there, they just, you know, compounded the situation, right? They had they had sensitive information like uh, social security numbers and credit card numbers that weren't masked, right? So they showed the entire thing. Um, they had data that was unnecessary for the task that the user was doing, right? Uh, being shown. So if you weren't updating your payment information, they didn't need to show the credit card information. If you didn't need to update your personal information, they didn't need to show the social security number. And then, you know, additionally, there was no secondary authentication before accessing sensitive data. So there, there were a couple of things that went wrong, right? The first one was they assumed that the authenticated user wouldn't change the account number. And this is something that that I hear a lot. Well, you know, uh, uh, an average user is not going to not going to do that. And that's true. An average user is not going to do these things. But when it comes to securing your website, it's not the average user that you need to protect yourself against, right? It's the bad guy who's going to be out there to attack it. Now, in this case, it was in the query string, but this is equally applicable to cookies, to headers, and anything else that's coming in from the client browser. All of that is potentially modifiable by an attacker. And so it needs to be treated as suspect. And in this case, they did not, right? Once it came in and the user was authenticated, it was all good. So the big sin, sin here was the use of magic URLs, right? So we had this magic URL, had your account information, and, and away you go. Um, and they also had some implementation sins. The big one, they failed to protect the stored data, right? We they had They had all this personally identifiable information. And, you know, maybe those credit card numbers were encrypted on the back end. Doesn't matter. Maybe that social security number was encrypted on the back end. Doesn't matter, right? Because at the end of the day, they exposed it right there on the website for all to see. And of course, information leakage, right? Whole bunch of information just leaked out, just like a sieve. And um, you know, it 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 had the potential to compromise, you know, millions of of users of this particular uh, toll road authority. Um, so that gives you kind of an idea of some of the things that can happen. Alonzo, to you for fail number two. Right. So fail number two is a one that I'm thinking everybody here in the session is probably really familiar with and has at least heard um, if they've been around, you know, working with applications or, or uh, with technology for a while, and that's Experian. Um, th this is probably like the epitome of failures uh, that had happened and we're going to talk about it a little bit but imagine for Experian it was, uh, over the course of 76 days uh, attackers slowly hijacked and exfiltrated data from 51 different databases I mean we're not talk just talking about a single application we're talking about a slew of different databases and in all of those databases you had everything from unencrypted credentials and that's usernames and passwords, and that's how they got access to the 51 other databases. Um, you had sensitive PII on basically 148 millions Americans, and that PII was made up of everything from full names, home addresses, phone numbers, dates of birth, social security numbers, driver's license numbers. I mean, essentially, you look at that, and you could basically steal an identity without any additional effort. Um, and not only that, you also had credit card numbers of approximately 200,000 consumers. So you've got the number and everything else that you would need to effectively use those credit cards uh, in a fraudulent fashion with very, very, very little effort. So we know what happened. We know that it happened over a long period of time, but how did it get to this point? Well, the biggest thing is that there was a known and patchable uh, remote code execution vulnerability in Apache Struts that was exploited. Apache Struts is the uh, runtime under which the uh, web application for Experian was being run. Uh, they received 
numerous uh, notifications from uh, different government sources, different security firms saying, hey, Apache is uh, has an exploit. You guys are running this version of Apache. You guys should be uh, patching this. And it went just disregarded completely. And nobody noticed what was happening until days later after it had started happening. Um, the other things that made this even worse is as attackers got in, uh, you know, they got into the database and found, uh, you know, using those usernames and passwords, got to additional databases, and those databases didn't have anything that was masked or encrypted. So it was just plain as day, clear text, being able to pull that information out. Uh, the application configuration also contained unencrypted credentials. They got that information, got into additional systems. We look at how the application and the databases were deployed and the network um, infrastructure between it. There was no isolation from one another or the application server. So once they were in, they were free to roam around, jump from one server to another, from one database to another, and just kept on going. The worst thing about all of this is that there's a good chance that all of this, even without a, uh, the uh, patching Apache struts, it could have been prevented because they had a security device on the network. But one of the requirements of a security device to do its thing is that it needed a, a number of SSL certificates that were valid, uh, that were installed within it and configured within it to be functional. Well, they were expired. And so I want to say that they found they were expired like 10 months prior to the attack. So you almost had a full year where this security device was sitting there just doing nothing. Um, so yeah, all of that together led to probably the biggest breach that we've seen in uh, cybersecurity history as far as that I'm aware of. So, you know, talking about the sins, these are, you know, sins that were the responsibility of the development team, some of the operation team, but I think it really comes down to the the software engineers that that uh, are responsible for these things. But you know, number one, we talked about this with fail number one was the failure to protect stored data. You've got sensitive information, mask it, encrypted. So even if that database does become compromised and somebody starts reading it, they don't have the keys to the kingdom and they can't get to it. It's not ideal, but it's an additional step that could have been taken. Uh, networking sins. Failing to protect network traffic. I mean, we're talking about that device that was out there in front uh, that was supposed to be the guard dog and preventing that. I and mean, this is why, also why we're focusing on application security. It's those other measures can fail or not do their job or be bypassed or compromised. And but it could have started there, and that didn't happen. Not to mention the isolation um, of the databases between each other, different subnets, firewalls between them, things like that could have kept attackers from hopping from one system to another. Uh, and the improper use of PKI, uh, PKI, and here we're talking about SSL, which is a certificate. Using an expired certificate is an improper way to use SSL. That's pretty much the gist of it. Joe, you got another one for us? Thanks, Alonzo. I certainly do. And <clears throat> you're probably beginning to notice a, a, a theme here. Um, in this one, you know, attackers were able to gain access to a central database uh, that contained user information for uh, Georgia Institute of Technology or Georgia Tech. Um, so this is our third in a row where we're talking about getting user PII. Um, so this is, you know, one of, one of the big things that they're after. It's highly valuable to attackers and they will go after it. Now, in this case, the attackers had access to the central database containing user information for about three months. And no one at Georgia Tech really noticed it until, well, I guess the attackers got a little too happy and caused a significant performance impact. So they, they, were, they were hitting it so hard that they slowed the website down noticeably. Now, this was disclosed just last april so just about a year ago a little over a year ago so this is recent this is you know um <laughs> not long ago at all and and information for 1.3 million employees and students was disclosed and this includes names date of birth addresses and social security numbers now in this case at least as far as we know credit card information was not exposed which is good I guess, right? But you still have everything you need to take out a credit card in someone else's name, right? You have their name, their date of birth, their address, their social security number. 
from there, you're golden. You can rock on. So again, what happened? How, how did this occur? Well, this particular one was a SQL injection flaw. So SQL injection is a well-known vulnerability. We've known about SQL injection since the late 90s, right? And yet we still see this over and over again in app after app after app. And here at Georgia Tech, just last year, they had a major SQL injection flaw in a web-based form that allowed attackers to craft SQL to extract that data. Some compounding factors, you know, again, <laughs> kind of beat it, reiterating a theme, sensitive data was not masked or encrypted, right, when it was at rest. So they were able to pull that data out completely and get a hold of it. Also, additional databases in the system were not isolated from each other or from the application server. So once they were able to gain access to one system, they were able to use that, piggyback off of that system, and gain access to additional systems and wind up with 1.3 million uh, records of personally identifiable information. Now, kind of the irony of it, too, is Georgia Tech has one of the top cybersecurity programs in the country. And even, e even they messed it up with a SQL injection flaw, a flaw that has been known for some 20 years and well-documented, very well-documented for some 20 years. So the big web application sin here is SQL injection. Um, again, the... <laughs> I, I just cannot reiterate this enough, right? I mean, we've known about SQL injection uh, for, for 20 years. When I first learned about it, geez, oh man, a long time ago, it was it was it was eye opening, right? Now the thing is, SQL injection is something that's relatively easy to prevent and mitigate against, and yet, over and over again, we see it. And you know, from an implementation sin perspective, right? Again, we're seeing failure to protect stored data. So a couple of themes here that, that we've been reiterating, because these are problems over and over again, and even some of the best organizations in the world that are supposed to really know this stuff, they mess up. It happens, and it, it, it happens quite a bit. Alonzo? You're on mute, Alonzo. Thank you, that auto mute button. So our last fail here, we're going to talk about a uh, subsidiary of FedEx. Um, you know, this is this is a little bit of an older one, but still relatively um, recent enough and applicable. So what happened here is FedEx ended up purchasing a company called Bongo back in uh, 2014. And as part of that purchase, they inherited all of their uh, assets, including you know, software, uh, in this particular case, we're going to be looking at is some AWS uh, accounts and subscriptions and an S3 bucket that we're going to be talking about here. But, you know, all of those IT assets came over infrastructure, cloud assets and everything else. So when they got this S3 bucket, nobody had known that for a significant amount of time prior to that, this bucket was left completely unsecured. Basically, anybody with the URL to that S3 bucket could index the, the uh, bucket and look at all the files that were uh, stored up there. Um, in that bucket, they had 119,000 scanned documents from customers who did business with Bongo uh, from 2019 to 2012. And those documents contained not just their orders, but scanned passports, driver's licenses, medical insurance uh, cards, and US military IDs. So yeah, not a database, not something they could, you know, go through relatively quickly, but you've got tons of documents that could be put out and distributed through different mechanisms for people that were interested in buying this information in huge amount of money in, the, in that black market today. So how did this actually happen? Well, we, we talked uh, um, about, about how they inherited this thing that was uh, unprotected. The interesting thing on this one is that nobody really knows whether or not those documents were actually breached, copied by attackers or not. It was literally years later that they found out that this uh, S3 bucket was unsecured and basically anybody who had that URL could have asked, accessed any of those documents at any time with a simple web browser. Again, nobody knows if it actually happened or not, but the potential was, was definitely there. The compounding factors here is, you know, sensitive data not being master encrypted, 
again, the recurring theme that we've seen, it's these are basically just scanned PDFs. There's, you can do things to protect that, but you know, once you get the file, you get the file. And that the unsecured bu bucket was not identified until 2017. So again, this happened prior to FedEx purchasing Bongo in 2014. And for three years, FedEx had this asset that was left unsecured until that time. Pretty amazing. So what sins occurred here? Uh, not so much on the application side because there really wasn't an application. I'm sure there was something that was consuming it and sending the files to that to that place as part of, of uh, their logistics process or order process and whatnot. But it's really just a simple implementation sin, which was failure to protect store data. And then this one was super, super simple, which is just restrict anonymous access to an S3 bucket. It's literally a one checkbox uh, in the UI for uh, AWS and a little bit of configuration for the applications that consume and write to that particular bucket. Um, it, it's astonishing when I look at this, I'm going, and I think if I recall correctly, AWS actually forces you by default to have that secured. So you actually have to actively go and say, no, 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 I want this to be anonymous. I mean, it just boggles my mind. Next slide, Jay. So overall, you know, other, other fails that we see. Uh, we we already mentioned one SQL injection attack, but injection attacks, period, right? Both SQL injection and PHP injection vulnerabilities continue to be the most exploited. And when 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 you think about this, a SQL injection attack, a PHP injection attack, right? You can have all the firewalls that you want. Right, those requests are typically going to go right through the firewall because they're going to the application. Right, those are application level failures, and a lot of times when it comes to securing our resources and and securing our networks, you know, we look at firewalls and you know we look at at doing this and doing that um, on the network side. And yes, we absolutely need to do that, but that's only one level, and you can do that all you want if you have these application level attacks. And these application level vulnerabilities, they're going to go right through the firewall, just like butter, right? So these kinds of injection attacks um, are widely exploited and among the most exploited out there. Um, we see internal client applications um, that clients are looking now with, with more and more remote workers and more and more of a remote workforce. Um, they're they're looking to make them accessible over over the cloud. And we see these internal applications with passwords stored in the clear. Um, we saw one where about 50% of the users had the default password of password, um, which is you know not really very good, right? And, and they were they were talking to us about you know making this more accessible to their remote workforce and you know hosting it up in the cloud. And we're like, yeah, not like this. Right. Or and and you know again we see this over and over again improper or no protection at all of PII. Um, the other thing that we see is um, uh, web apps that are missing HTTP security headers. Now there's a bunch of other vulnerabilities that we really didn't touch on things like cross-site scripting and uh, uh, frame jacking and and that kind of stuff. And um, They've become big enough issues that there are standardized HTTP security he headers that can help mitigate. They won't prevent, but will help mitigate some of those issues. Um, and we see web apps that are just absolutely missing those, right? And that's a really easy thing that can be put in place um, that can help mitigate some of these attacks. Not all of them, but some of them. Eliza, what else do we see? Oh, man. <clears throat> You know, t talking about the, the things that we see as consultants with, with uh, customers coming to us with their applications, th that one of the most common things that that I found is just failure to handle errors correctly. So this is, you know, an exception occurs in an MVC application, and that gets bubbled up to the top, top and you get the whole stack trace uh, printed on on that pretty white and yellow web page uh, that contains, you know, you're exposing so much in that, you know, what uh, technology you're running on, what version of the .NET framework's running, you can look at the stack trace. Um, and in some of those cases, you also get just custom error messages. Like, say you don't get that, that yellow screen that we're talking about, but you get a, a generic error message that's just presented up to the user that contains additional information that's telling the attacker what they did wrong. 
And but that you, tells what, tells me how to fix it, right? Exactly. You know, what do I do next to, to bypass this and get to that next step? Um, you know, but we're talking about all these attacks and, and the things that we see wrong, you know, in a very specific impl implementation and you're know, talking about mechanics here. But strategically, one of the things that, that, that we often fa fail to see is that there's security, security really isn't part of the development process. You know, it's thought after as, as a... a it, it, and we see this all this time, and, and I'll be the first to admit, you know, I, I've done this where, where uh, as a developer, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to worry about that. I've got a security team to handle that. The network team will help me out with that. Uh, somebody, you know, and, and you're pushing off that responsibility to somebody else. And the 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 software development life cycle, whether you're doing Scrum or Kanban or anything else, really doesn't take security to be part of that DevOps process. And it really should. because. You know, we're building pipelines, we're building uh, obviously the application, uh, but we're defining, uh, you know, what cloud resources we're using, uh, you know, as developers, we're also, or architects and engineers, we're defining uh, how many web servers we need and database servers and how they're going to be configured to talk to each other. And it's got to be something that we keep top of mind because it's not just the code base itself, but it's the implementation and the hosting that, you know, as engineers, we have that all right in front of us and could really minimize uh, the number of issues that we see in attacks that are successful if we made that a regular part of our process. So why now? Um, well, why not? I mean, th this is this has been a topic that has been getting more and more interest, um, you know, over the past, you know, 20 or, or, or so years, but really, you know, what we're seeing now in the past 10 years is a growing trend of data breaches and where you have, you know, not just, you know, Joe hacker sitting in the basement, right? You know, the kind of archetype, uh, archetype of, of the hacker sitting in the basement, eating pizza and drinking Mountain Dew, right? We're actually not seeing that so much anymore. We're seeing more involvement from organized crime and foreign governments uh, that are behind a lot of these data breaches. So this, the level of sophistication in the past 10 years has significantly increased. We're also seeing things like OS level attacks that are getting more and more difficult. So the major vendors out there have really kind of gotten this and 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 taken taken a lot of this to heart. You know, we don't see things like Code Red or SQL Slammer uh, very much anymore, right? Those things, they've got most of that down, right? And so what the attackers are doing is they're going, okay, so that's getting harder. So I'm going to go after the easy targets, right? I'm going to go after the apps, right? And so these breaches and attacks are targeting the applications, um, even fully customized ones, right? Because they know the these attackers know that behind those custom app applications is valuable business data and valuable PII. And also, you know, with with everything that's been going on this year, 2020, um, with with COVID and and shutdowns and this that and all the other, um, we are seeing more and more organizations that are looking to the cloud to enable their remote workforce. Now, certainly in the past 10 years, we kind of, we saw this, this was happening, right? But this past year, it has really just exploded. And previous, you know, internal only applications that had these issues where, you know, perhaps it wasn't as accessible, um, you know, made it less of a of a a an issue. Um, you know, now we have customers looking to put them up in the cloud and have them exposed to the the public internet. Um, and more BDE, you know, business to employee applications are are moving outside the firewall to enable these remote workforces. Um, we're going to see this trend continuing, and and it's kind of a frightening thing. Um, when you when you look across the landscape at, at some of the, the failures that we see in application development and the more organizations that are doing this, um, the more that are going to get attacked. And if you think that your little website out there on this super secret URL isn't getting attacked, you're wrong. Because these attackers with organized crime and foreign governments um, that have a significant amount of resources behind them, 
they are automating searching for vulnerable apps. If you watch a, a firewall or if you watch, say, application gateway that's sitting out on the internet, you will see these attacks coming in from all over the place as they're trying to poke and prod and see where those vulnerabilities are. So it is absolutely happening. So hopefully we've scared you guys enough into looking at your application security at least a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things that we do here at Catapult is we do an application security assessment. And this this is a, a, a type of engagement that's relatively short where we go in and we look at that custom application and we look for those common things. We look for, you know, what are the web application issues? Uh, what are the implementation issues? The things that we kind of talked about are included in that, but it's a much broader list of about two dozen items that we're looking for. Uh, cryptographic issues, you know, are we doing correct random number generation to generate the uh, truly random salts when we're doing a two-way encryption or one-way hashing and those kinds of things. And common network issues that we see between applications, making sure we've got enough security around the environment in between the components to make sure we're not, we're not uh, um, leaving things exposed as we need to. And out of that assessment, really what we're coming back with is a list of prioritized corrective actions uh, going, hey guys, if you don't patch this, you're looking at a huge issue to probably not a big deal, but we probably, we you definitely should get around to this sooner rather than later. 